Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Anybody ready to get into the Word of the Lord tonight? I am so excited about the Word. Let's do this, because you didn't come to hear from Pastor Dan. Thank God, because Pastor Dan has nothing to say. He didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color that we could imagine. He came to hear from God. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is the teacher of the church. So let's invite him to come and be our teacher. If you have the ability, would you stand your feet and honor the Lord? I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're grateful we get to come into your house tonight openly and freely. God, we can lift our hearts and our hands, our voices to you, God. Thank you, God, for the shout that we just had and for your presence in this place tonight, God. We are so grateful. God, we ask that as we open up your word that you open it up to us. Open us up to receive it, Lord. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come now. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, even the direction and, and, and the uh, correction that we need for our lives, Lord. And we praise you and thank you for that. God, we ask for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you bless them, Lord. Bless all of our brothers and sisters. Bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest, O Valley and Oasis. Inland Christian, God, we thank you for the well and the way, God, for Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist Trinity, God, for the assemblies and the four square denominations, God, for all the great churches that are out there, God, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, if they're preaching Jesus as Lord, we bless them as you would bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. You can be seated. Tonight, this is the blessed life, part number two. Let me remind you of where we've been in part number one for those of you that missed part number one. Matthew chapter five, if you want to turn there with me to Matthew chapter five, we're going to read verse number one all the way through verse Number 12, God knows that we in our life want to be blessed, that in our lives, e even in, in the natural, when you take a look at uh, people that are without God, their aim is to be blessed. They want to be happy in life. Uh, we, we even have the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is one of our freedoms that we enjoy in this nation. And knowing this, God knows that we want to be blessed, but also God wants to bless us. And therefore, God, seeing our common aim and our common goal, wants to get the blessing to us, but he wants to do it at the right time in the right way. And so Jesus comes on the scene, and Jesus teaches us what the blessed life looks like. Now, in our eyes, when we take a look at the teachings of Jesus and we see what he's saying about what a blessed person is, we kind of scratch our heads and say, well, Lord, that doesn't look really blessed. You know, in the world, if you have money and you have fame and you have fortune, you have wealth, you have health, you have all these things, that's blessed. And yet Jesus comes and, and, and he flips the coin over on us, so to speak, and he shows us what a truly blessed life really looks like. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse number 1 and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. When he, came, uh, when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Verse number two, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, verse number three, blessed. Everybody say blessed. blessed. See, we're talking about the blessed life. And so here Jesus is. And the first thing out of his mouth when he sits to teach those who came to him is there is a blessing coming to a certain type of people. Here's who they are. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Verse number 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for the, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 11, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now last time we were together we talked about how to live the blessed life and we started with the first two of these beatitudes 
Really, that's the, the word in the Latin, is beatitude. This is, uh, in English, we could say this is how we ought to be. This is the attitude that we ought to be. So it's a be attitude, how to live the blessed life. We ought to have this sort of a mindset inside of us. First one is empty yourself. And you remember, I, I capitalized the word self. We've got to get rid of that. We can't have any sufficiency in our own self when we come to God because God is the all-sufficient one, and therefore we find our sufficiency in Him. We have to humble ourselves and say, you know what, God? I've got nothing on my own. I'm not cool. I'm not smart. I'm not wealthy. I'm not powerful. I'm not any of those things, God. I need you, and I need you to come through now. And that's that poverty that comes out of us. That's that poor in spirit that we come to God, and he says, you're blessed. Why? Because you will be. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. You will be resourced. You will be blessed. Okay, and secondly, we, we found out in verse number four, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And, and remember, we talked about mourning, that that was a deep care, that we would deeply care, that when we sin, when we mess up, we would deeply care. We wouldn't just, oh, well, you know, the blood of Jesus covers it. No, we would sorrow over our sin, that we would shed tears over our sin. When we see pain and suffering in the world, that we wouldn't say, oh, man, that's, that's tough. I, I hope they make it. No, that we would be moved to care and that we would be moved enough by our care to pray for people and to intercede and to do what we can in those areas. Tonight, I want to talk to you about a couple more. We'll take two more tonight, and then next time we get together on the subject, we'll continue on. Number three for tonight, how to live the blessed life. Number three, this one is called being readily submitted, readily submitted, the meek. Look at verse number five of Matthew chapter five once again. It says this, it says, blessed, everybody say blessed. Blessed Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth or the land, some of your translations say. Blessed are the meek. Now the problem is when we read something like this, we don't use words like meek very often. And when we do, we see a word like meek and and we see words associated with it like gentleness or self-control. And we start to take a look at that and we kind of go, hmm, well, you know, if meek is gentle and self-controlled, that means that there's no crazy involved. There's no, uh, you know, boisterous involved. There's no, uh, you know, shazam, no panache, no, no, that's just meek. That kind of rhymes with weak. And so we think, blessed are the weak. Well, that's kind of weird. They'll inherit the earth, and I don't know what that means or how to do that. So we quickly read on to verse number six, hoping that we can understand that. And yet tonight, Jesus is speaking something to us that he wants to get to us so that he can get it in us, so that he can get it through us. Jesus wants this characteristic in our life, and if we skip over this, we're going to miss out on a blessing. Are you listening tonight? Because I don't know about you, I want every bit of blessing that the Lord has for me. When I get to heaven, I I don't want to go to the storeroom. Maybe you heard that, you know, God, somebody died. They went up to the storeroom. It's a a fictional story. This is not Bible now, okay? So don't go go looking for this in your Bible. You're not going to find it. It's just a fictional story. Somebody made up that, you know, when they got to heaven, that the angel took them and was all sad and took them to the storeroom. And these are all the blessings and all the answered prayers you could have had on earth. Anybody heard that story before? Listen, when I get to heaven... If there is a storehouse, I want to go in and it's empty. I want them to say, thank you for wiping us out. Thank you for using your blessings. Thank you for praying in the blessings. Thank you for everything. Because you know what? I don't want to miss out on what God has for me. And the Bible says that I I am already spiritually, Ephesians, the first chapter, blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if I ain't blessed in life, then I'm not doing something right. Are you listening? Because I already have it, and if I have it and it's not showing up in my life, then I'm, I'm obviously not using it. Because there's no problem with the word. Hello? No problem with the word. The problem then is with me, and that's with my understanding. i got to read the manual and find out what is this talking about. So what does meek mean? What does meek mean? Well, I already kind of gave it away. Readily submitted. Meekness is not weakness. Let me say this again because I need you to get this into your head. Meekness is not Weakness. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, meekness ain't weakness. Look at your other neighbor and say what he said. <laughs> meekness is not weakness. Can I, can I define meekness for you for a second? It is power under control. Power under control. I love our administrator, Fred Adams. I like picking on Fred, too. Fred's wonderful. Fred one time invited me out to 
Amapola, I think I said that correctly, okay? And he, he gave me tacos of parts of the cow that I didn't even know existed there at Amapola, okay? And he thought it was funny feeding me stuff that I don't think people should eat, okay? So, so we had a good time. We had a good lunch. And, and, and we went out, you know, around the hood, and he was telling me I used to live down the street and this and that, okay? We had a good time. Now, for those of you that don't know, Fred drives a sports car, and he should. I mean, the guy is just wonderful, and, and you know, he doesn't have any hair, so it's not going to mess up his hair when he puts the top down, okay? So Fred and I are walking to his car after lunch, and he had driven us there, and he says, you want to drive it back? And, you know, myself, <laughs> I, I like me a fast, nice car, you know. So I used to work at Walmart Tire and Lube Express, and I'd get excited with the Corvettes and the Camaros would come in, you know. So here he, 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 he says, would you like to drive my sports car? And I said, ooh, yeah, I would love to. So I get in the driver's seat and adjust it and adjust the mirrors and everything like that. Started up, boom, 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 you know, and, and it just, ooh, it feels good. And the thing is purring on the freeway. We're just going back. And you know, right over here where the, the 215 merges onto the 10 East, 215 South to the, to the 10 East, there's that big, long overpass, right? Now, normally, when I'm in my car and I hit uphill, I need to give a little bit more gas so that it can continue to take the speed up and around, right? Many of you know what I'm talking about, especially if you're driving a four-cylinder. You're like, pedal to the metal, baby, we're going uphill. <laughs> but Fred's car is a sophisticated car, and it responds to your every move, your every whim. And so here I am in this sports car driving, and I give it a little bit more gas going up the hill because that's my natural response, and that sucker got up and ran. You know what I mean by that? <laughs> And, I, and, and here's the deal. I was so scared I couldn't stop. <laughs> you know, it was that sort of thing as we're going up. And, and Fred's just laughing. And I'm like, this is not funny. You know, we're going to go flying off the edge and, and land in the ocean or something with, with how this thing's going. But he loved it, man. I guess, I guess that's what you do in that car. So I don't know. See, See, that car was meek. What does that mean? It was readily submitted to me. When I gave it a little bit of gas, it said, oh, you want to get up and run? Okay, let's go, right? And the power that was under the control of the driver was now released in the direction that the driver was going. See, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. Hello. How do I know this? Because the ultimate sports car of human beings, if I can use that terminology now that we've used that illustration, was Jesus, right? If he was, if he was the Aston Martin, the BMW, the Rolls Royce of people, if you will, then Jesus was the ultimate driving machine, right? He was the perfect one under the control of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says your king is coming to you lowly and meek. Is that right? Come to me, you who are heavy laden with your burdens, for I am lowly, I am meek and gentle of spirit. See, Jesus was not weak. Jesus willingly went to a beating and to an execution on the cross. That is not weak, that is strength, that is power under control. So if my King Jesus, God in the flesh, the Almighty, the star breather, the all-sufficient one, the all-powerful one, if he's meek, then I want to be like him. Power under control. See, that's where you see, I could break you, but I won't. Power under control. I could, but I'm going to readily submit myself. See, meekness, first of all, is towards God. Okay? First and foremost, your meekness is in the direction of God. It is ultimate submission to his will. See, we don't fight against God or resist God, but against our stubborn flesh, which wills against God. See, our battle is not against God. Our battle is against what's going on inside of us. And God has assignments, God has plans, and God needs us to direct our focus and our power and our attention in his direction and what God wants us to do. And yet, oftentimes we find ourselves resisting God, fighting against God. That's not meekness now, that's weakness because you're letting something else control you other than God. That's the weakness of the flesh. 
See, but if you can allow the strength of the Spirit to be readily submitted to the will and the word of God, now you've got strength. Because when I am weak, then I am strong, right? You're submitted to the will of God. Grace of God comes in and takes over and does it, right? Like what E.W. Vine said in his dictionary of, of Greek words, he said, is, speaking of meekness, it is that temper of spirit in which we accept God's dealings with us as good. You've got to get a hold of this. And therefore, without disputing or resisting. You read that too again. Talking about meekness, it is that temper of spirit in which we accept God's dealings with us as good. In other words, there are going to be times where God wants you to do something, give something, go somewhere, talk to somebody. Uh, you know, you're going to go through a spell in life. Now, I'm not blaming God for sickness. I hope you know this. I'm not blaming God for lack. I'm not blaming God for any of these things. But God speaks to us oftentimes in these hard times in life. When the trials of the test come and God starts directing our life. So when we go through times in life and especially pruning, especially when God is asking us to give, especially when God is asking us to serve, especially when God is asking us to be unselfish and get outside of ourselves. See, that's God's direction and we know it's godly. And yet the flesh is going to say, oh, I don't want to do that. Why? Because the flesh is about self. It's selfish. But if you have emptied yourself, like we talked about, you've got that poverty of spirit, now you're humble, then when you start to be meek and readily submit to the word of God, you're not going to have any problems. There will be no resistance towards God. You will be that well-oiled machine with no friction, no resistance against God. No, you'll be able to work with God. Why? Because we know that his dealings with us are good. We know that God, whatever you're doing, God, if you're asking me to give, then God, I know there's a blessing coming. God, I know that if I give this, I'm not going to lack on the other end because, God, you don't want that for my life. God, you're going to supply all of my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God, I know that if you're asking me to take some time where I could have been resting and relaxing on the couch to invest it in my family, that I'm going to have a better family. God, I know that I, I could be out there watching the movie, but you asked me to, to share Jesus with this person outside sitting on the street. And God, I, I know that you will redeem the time, God, and, and, and it's not going to be as good if I, if I walked you know, away as if I walked to the will of God. See, you can know that God's dealings with you are good. I love what James chapter 1 Verse 21 says, says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with what? What's that word? Meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. See, you cannot even get saved unless you submit yourself to the word of God. Cannot come into the kingdom unless you come in God's way. That's called meekness. It's power under control. Meekness is towards God first. Meekness, secondly, is towards others. Meekness, secondly, is towards others. I kind of alluded to this when I said I could break you, but I won't. See, many times we're going to encounter people in life that, that are going to be grating, that are going to be hard to deal with, whether they be a family member, a relative, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor. You know, it could be anyone in our life. And even though we could blast people, even though we could hurt people, even though we could ignore people, if we are meek, then we're gentle with them. See, the disciples, when... They were told they couldn't go into a city. They were rejected. They said, Jesus, should we call down fire out of heaven on them? We, we'd love to. Elijah did it. Can we do it? Huh? Jesus, you don't know what spirit you are of. You don't know what you're asking for. See, Jesus was meek. I, I have the power to do this, but, but I'm not going to. Jesus could have taken all the people who were coming against him, the centurions, he could have taken all the Romans. He could have taken all the Jews. He could have taken all them. And legions of angels could have come at his aid at any second if he called on them, but he never did. He submitted himself to the will of God, and he submitted himself to man. Isn't that amazing? Allowed himself to be punched, to be spit on, to have his beard pulled. And, and yet, oftentimes, we have a hard time when it comes to relationships. Maybe we need to submit ourselves to one another. See, the Bible tells us that we're here to be meek. Meekness is actually a fruit of the Spirit, if you look it up. When you take a look at the fruit of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, see, if I'm walking in the flesh, there's no meekness. I'm going to pop you in the nose if you talk about me, you know? And, and then I'm going to kick you in the shin when you're looking down, you know, because that's just how we roll. But see, meekness, when you're walking in the Spirit, you can talk about me all you want. Doesn't matter. Rolls off my back. Why? Because, hey, they persecuted the Lord, so I guess they're going to persecute me. 
And that's where we walk. We walk in meekness. Ephesians chapter 4, turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 4, talking about meekness towards one another. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, great chapter when talking about dealing with others. Talks about our words. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse number 1. Paul writes and he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. So I beg you, is really what he's saying. I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now up on the overheads, I have it in the old King James Version. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. Now verse number two, if you don't have the old King James, look up on the overheads for, for me for a second. Look at what he says, with, very important. So he says, walk worthy of your calling that God called you. See, God has called you to something. God has called you to where you're at right now. God has called you to the family that you're at. God has called you to the city that you're living in. God has called you to the occupation that you currently hold. Therefore, he says, walk worthy of that calling. God has called you for such a time as this, in such a place as this, to impact the people that are around you. So walk worthy of your calling. Now look at what he says, with. So you have to have something in that in order to walk worthy. With all lowliness and, what is that word once again? Meekness, power under control. Walk out your calling. Walk worthy of your calling with all lowliness and meekness. Look at this, with long suffering. You know what that means? Flip the words around. Suffering for a long time. Longer than you want to. Because I know for me, any amount of suffering is longer than I want to. I'm a big baby. And yet God is saying, I want you to be long suffering. That's another one of those fruit of the Spirit, forbearing one another in love. In other words, put up with each other, especially in the church. You know what? You know, sometimes people say, well, I got offended at that church. Well, yeah, there's people in that church. <laughs> See, if you find the perfect church, the moment we show up, not perfect anymore. We're all flawed. And guess what? Even pastors, myself included, are going to say things, do things that are going to rub you the wrong way. But you know what? If you realize that, well, we're all blood, you say, well, you know, my last name's not Roth. Your last name's not Garcia, Smith. How are we one blood? The blood of Jesus. Binds us all together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. See, when, when I was growing up, my brother could smack me in the face. He could kick me. He could jump on me and do that little thing, to, you know, where, where it hurts. You know, he could do that over and over and over again. But guess what? He was still my brother afterwards. I could never say, oh, I disown you. No, there's blood. There's DNA. See, now we are all linked together. And, and yes, somebody in this church may offend you, but don't let that run you off. Why? Because we're family. So overlook the offense and love past it. Love through it. The Bible says love covers the multitude of sins. And as you walk in the Spirit and you bear with one another in love, now all of a sudden the offense is covered and now you are operating in meekness. Not weakness. Meekness. Power under control. Are you listening today? So what's the blessing that comes from being meek? Here it is. If we are meek, then we will enjoy what is given to us here and in the hereafter. Because the meek shall inherit the earth. There's a new heaven and a new earth and coming in whom righteousness dwells. You can find that in the book of Revelation that, that God says now the dwelling of God is with man. And there will be a day when the new Jerusalem comes together and the Lamb will give us light and we will all be together. But guess what? You don't have to wait until eternity to enjoy what God has given us. God has given us things here in life now to enjoy. And if you are meek, then you're going to enjoy everything that God has offered you here on the earth. Are you listening? That's the blessing that comes. Second thing that I want to look at tonight, last one for tonight, is this. How to live the blessed life. Number four is have godly desire. Have godly desire. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, we all have desires, every single one of us in this room. In fact, if you went outside of this room, you went out there into the world and found people, doesn't matter if they're believers, unbelievers, you will find everyone has desires. Could be money, could be acceptance, could be power, 
could be, uh, you know, any number of things. Everyone has desires. Some people desire to get married. Some people desire to have a family, have children. Some people desire to have a good job and a career. They don't want to just exist or, you know, do a job. They want a career. They want a, a life's purpose. See, everyone has desires. But Jesus did not say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. He said that there was a specific thing that we should hunger and thirst after. And that word is righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's why it wasn't just having desire, blessed are those who desire. No, it's blessed are those who have a godly desire. In other words, your desire submitted to the will and way of God now will be blessed in life. Now, righteousness, what is that? We've got to define what righteousness is because if we're going to hunger and thirst after something, we need to know what it is. So what is righteousness? Well, many times we think of righteousness as a position because positionally with God, we have been made righteous. In other words, I was in the wrong place with God. I was at war with God. The Bible says I was at enmity. The Bible uses that, that term, enmity. Really, it's a warring against God. That is the wrong position with God. Why? Because you're fighting a losing battle. You cannot fight against God and win. So that is the wrong position. But when I laid down my arms, and when I gave up my rebellion, and when I said, Lord, I can't do this, I had that spiritual poverty, and I mourned over my sin enough, grieved enough, and cared enough to do something about it, and went to the Lord, and now submitted myself in meekness to his will, to his way, I'm not going to go in any other way. I've got to go God's way. And so now when I gave God all my heart, gave God all my life, and I was born again, now all of a sudden I have a right position with God. In other words, I'm no longer opposed to God on the opposite side. Now I'm on the Lord's side. I am now a part of the family of God. I have a position with God, and that is called righteousness. Okay? That is right standing or a right position with God. Now, righteousness has another facet or another angle that we need to talk about because I want to major on what we're talking about now. Righteousness, the original word for righteousness in the Old English, okay? We're talking 16th, uh, 17th century, somewhere around there, okay? Was uh, instead of righteous, it was right wise. In other words, we would add the ness on it, right? Right wiseness. So it was the right wisdom for how to do life. And that is what the righteousness of God is in our lives. That it is now not only the position, but it is the practice, the everyday living out of God's will and God's way for our life. That is righteousness for us. Okay? So that means blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness or the right wiseness, the right wisdom for their life from the will and the word of God. Are you listening tonight? See, you can have hungers, you can have desires, but if it's not a godly desire based on godly things, it's going to leave you empty. We sang it tonight, Psalm chapter 42, verse 1 and 2. I'll just put it up on the overheads for time's sake. Look at Psalm 42, verse number 1. It says, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul for you, O God. I love that. He says, just think about a deer up in the mountains. It's dry, there's been no rain. And it's searching for a little stream or a little brook, somewhere where it can quench its thirst. And it's panting for that, running around to and fro. Its breath is hot. Its tongue is dry. Just like the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you. In other words, God, I'm searching for you in a dry and weary land. God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I desire you above all else. Verse number two, my soul thirsts for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? You can feel the passion and the desire. I will take no substitutes. Nothing else will satisfy. God, I need you. God, I want you. God, you are my desire. You're my aim. You're my focus, God. God, I gotta have you. God, I will take nothing else because you alone will satisfy my soul. When can I come before you, God? See, the blessing of hungering and thirsting for righteousness is that we will be filled. In other words, God will leave no soul hungry who hungers and thirsts after him. They, see, there are ungodly desires that we've received, right? Some of us desired wealth, and we went after wealth, and we got wealth, and we said, after we got all that wealth, this is nothing. This is vanity. This is here today and gone tomorrow. It's going to blow away with the wind. It gains wings and it flies away. 
We've received desire. Some of us desired, well, you know, I really want to get married or, you know, I really want to have a, a, a relationship. We went and got that relationship and we found ourselves just as empty. Why? Because it wasn't a godly desire in us. It was a selfish desire that we could spend on ourselves. But now all of a sudden when you flip over and you hunger and thirst for righteousness, now you will be filled. That word filled, when Jesus used that word filled, it's the same word that he talked about when, when, when he went out and he fed the 5,000 and they ate and they were filled. You know what that means? Filled. That means overflowing. See, they had seven baskets left over and 12 baskets left over of the fragments that were left over after feeding the 5,000 and feeding the 4,000. They were filled. In fact, the Stoics of ancient Greece used to make fun of the common people saying when they ate and they were filled that they were like the, the sheep and the cattle out there on the pasture. Because that's where the word originally came from, is that these sheep had so much grass and so much food that they could be fatted. Right? And, and, and a healthy, fat sheep was good for its owner. See, in the same way, God is saying, I will lead you, I will guide you, and if you hunger and thirst after me, then you will be filled. You will be spiritually fatted. You will be Somebody who has more than enough. You will receive and receive in abundance. See, God leaves no soul hungry and thirsty who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. God's will, God's way. Now, I need you to follow me, okay? Everybody got their thinking caps on for a second? Okay? Because you guys got a little bit quiet, so I'm not going to let you be quiet. I want you to think about this for a second, okay? Think about this. We gain strength in the natural by what we feed on. Is that true? Okay, you gotta, you gotta answer me, all right? So I heard, heard a couple of people. We gain strength by what we feed on. Is that true? Yeah. Yes, we do. Okay, we feed on what we desire. Yes? Okay, so there's times where we feed on the wrong things because we desire the chocolate cake. And so we fed on it. So we gain strength by what we feed on. Now that chocolate cake will give you some strength, right? You will have a spike. <laughs> but guess what? You're coming down, baby. <laughs> okay? The amount of desire... You still with me? The amount of desire is also the amount of consumption. So there was a whole chocolate cake, and now there's a half, because I desired half. Maybe there's a whole chocolate cake, and now I don't know what happened to the chocolate cake, because I had a greater desire, okay? The amount of desire is also the amount of consumption. The amount of consumption is the amount of power. Or the amount of filling. Okay? Now when it comes to the things of God, righteousness, we gain strength by what we feed on. If you are feeding on the wrong things, you will have no strength. It may carry you for a moment, but it will never fill you. So you need to feed on the word of God. You need to feed on the presence of God. You need to feed on the power of God. You need to feed on the wisdom of God. You need to feed on the righteousness of God. You need to feed on the presence of God. See, you got to feed on the right thing. We feed on what we desire. See, if you are desiring after God and you're going after God and you're saying, God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I'm submitted to you. God, I don't care. Forsaking all others, God, I'm going after you. Then you will feed on what you desire. I can tell you who desires God. They're here with their Bible in hand. They're they're here as quickly as they can get. I know some of you guys come from work, so don't think I'm, I'm down on you right now. But you know, the people that, that want to get here are here. They got their Bible. They're ready. They're taking notes. They're coming after it. They're chomping at the bit. They're, they're afterwards, they're talking about it. They're telling their family members about it. They're inviting people to church. I can tell the people that desire God. Because when they come in the doors, man, they are ready to go. See, and, and, and the amount of desire is also the amount of consumption. I can tell you the people that are really, really going after God because I don't see them just on Sunday morning. I don't see them just on Wednesday night. I don't see them just on Sunday night. I don't see them coming to the girlfriend's Bible study only. I don't see them coming just to Friday night for the year. I see them all the time. There have been people... 
that I've walked out in the courtyard, there's no church going on. They're just sitting there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, go home. You're here more than I am. And I, I get paid to be here. You know, I'm a pastor in this place. What's going on? And they say, I just want more God. Just got to get close to where I connect with God. You know, I just got to have more of God. See, the amount of desire is the amount of consumption. And the amount of consumption is the amount of filling, the amount of power. See, power-packed Christians, people who are thriving in life are the ones who are getting as much of God as they can. Now, I know work schedules. I know all that kind of stuff, okay? So remember, I'm not downing anybody. I know some of you guys, all you can get is one a week. But man, listen to the podcast, Get a CD on your way out. Get more of God. Hopefully, you're reading your Bible at home on a regular basis. Hopefully, you know, you're praying there on your own or with your spouse or with your family, whatever. Hopefully, you're getting as much of God as you can. And that desire will make you go after the things of God. And then you will consume the things of God. And then you will be the powerful Christian that God has called you to be. Filled with the things of God. Can you say amen? Last scripture for tonight, last scripture for tonight, John chapter 6, verse number 35. Take a look at it with me. If you want to turn there in your Bible, go ahead. Great scripture. John chapter 6, verse number 35. Look at what Jesus says, speaking of himself, right? John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Why? Because Jesus is the filler. Jesus is the the bread. Jesus is the word made flesh. Jesus is the one that we feed on. Jesus is the one who is faithful. See, the world may tell you, stay thirsty, my friends. No, 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 no. You're, you're, you're going to be thirsty, and they want you to stay thirsty because they want to string you along with their, oh, come drink our booze. You're going to love life, and you're going to be the most interesting man in the world. No, you're going to be the dumbest man in the world. That's how that ends up. Let me just tell you the end of that story. But see, the world will never fill you up. Only Jesus can satisfy your true heart's desire. God has placed it on the inside of us to long after him. And you're blessed when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, after his will and his way. What have we learned so far? Well, we've learned... How to live the blessed life. First, empty yourself. Be poor in spirit. Second, deeply care more. And third, readily submit it. Being meek. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under the control of the Holy Spirit. Number four, have a godly desire. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you will be filled. You guys get anything out of the word of the Lord tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, you guys have been great tonight. Let's, let's do a couple more things before we leave. I'm going to invite people who have not yet given their hearts to the Lord tonight to do just that. Remember, we talked about being meek and submitted to God's way. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to go to hell. And our society's trying to feed us a lie that there is no hell. But the problem with that thinking is that, did you know that the Bible speaks about hell? It talks about it. You can find hell in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. And you're not going to avoid hell just by saying it doesn't exist. It doesn't go away just because you ignore it. You've got to face the reality of it. And God loves you and doesn't want you to go there. You say, well, doesn't that mean that God's going to just make any way lead to heaven? You do your thing, I do my thing. The churches, they can all do their thing. And we'll all get to heaven somehow, some way. Listen, do you think that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried out his son Jesus, went to the cross a beaten, bloody mess, do you think that he'd say after all that, well, yeah, just do whatever you want to do, and they can do what they do, and I'll just see all there somehow, some way. No, he tells us exactly how to get to heaven in his word. Can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. It's God's way or no way. You're not going to make it unless you go God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. It's God's heaven. Got to get there God's way. Sometimes people hear that statement, they say, well, that's good news, Pastor, because I've been a good person, done a lot of good deeds throughout my lifetime, you know, and I believe I'm going to get to go to heaven because I'm good. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible say be good and you get to go to heaven? In fact, the Bible says that there's not one righteous, no, not one. No one can get there on their own. Can't get there on your own merit. You can't do enough good works. Why? Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. 
You're not going to make it there based on your goodness. Your goodness compared to God's goodness, that's like filthy rags to God. That means it's going to get thrown out. Not going to make it just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? You wore religious jewelry. You know, you, you, you were uh, one of those people, you were raised in church and you went to religious class, Sunday school, catechism class, Sabbath school class, baptized or Christian, and I always consider myself to be a Christian. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible to say that you're raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nor in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or Christian as a child, or be born in America, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And again, nowhere in the Bible do I see that because you're not some other religion, that by default God lumps you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Tonight, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Sometimes people think, well, pastor, hold on a second, because, you know, uh, not only when I was a child did I go to church, hey, I'm sitting in church right now, sitting in front of you. And I consider myself to be a Christian. That's great. Could you just show that to me, the Bible, where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It doesn't work. That's like saying I could go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, sit in the dugout, wear the uniform, bring my bat and my ball, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. Yet, you know what's going to happen if they find me sitting there? They're going to drag me out and knock me up. Why? Because I'm not a Dodger. Same way you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. You might be thinking, okay, I get that, I understand that, but you know, my last church I got involved, helped out, sang in the choir for a number of years, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I, I even got a membership card. Now, while that's great and I'm glad you did those things, just, could, could you just show that to me in the Bible where your church involvement gets you into heaven? It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible say you help out, make decisions, people think of you as a leader, sing in the choir. You get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible God is looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. Listen, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. If that's how you think you're going to get there, you're not going to make it. So you say, but hold on a second, Pastor. I know God. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm cool. I'm a Christian. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Sing the songs of Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. That's great. Could you just show that to me in the Bible? Because if you'd read your Bible, you would know that demons know who Jesus Christ is. They're not Christians. You would know that the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental ascent towards God or having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence as hell. Rather, this is about your heart. God's always been about your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus, probably a better guy than all of us in this room, if I could be honest with you all. Probably did more good deeds. He was raised up in his church called the synagogue. He became a leader. He taught people about God. He was a teacher in Israel. Tell people about God. He could quote the scripture. He could debate the scripture. Hey, listen to this. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? And yet when Jesus comes to this great man of Israel by the name of Nicodemus, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, keep going, man. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, and some of you guys turn off when you hear that and say, oh, born again, I heard about that on television. You know, I read about that in that book, and I, I saw it on the internet in that blog, and I don't want to have anything to do with it. That's weirdo stuff, you know? But listen, let's not define what being born again is by the world's foolishness. Let's define it by the word of God. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's that simple. All or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but really, what's he talking about? Lukewarm. What's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity, just like I said. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When I make that sound, my hands, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. Remember, we're doing this God's way. 
being meek, submitted to his will, submitted to his way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, you're called your choice. When you hear that sound, my hands pop together, bang, get your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. I'm doing it God's way. You say, but wait, 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 hold on. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Let's push past that embarrassment tonight. Let's get over that. Because remember, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. That's what you want. Think of the trade-off. No one would make that trade. A moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell, away from God forever and ever and ever? Come on. No one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks that you are. And that's why he's trying to push you out of this right now. You push past that embarrassment. Say, I'm going on with God. Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God, acknowledging your need for Jesus by simply raising your hand in a moment. All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're out watching my television, in the foyer or in the Love Rock Cafe or online, across the nation and around the world. You ready to get your hand up right where you're at? God is watching you, and then you can click the button on our homepage, respond to God, or if you see the blue button next to it, respond to God, you can click that, and someone will lead you in a prayer right afterwards. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. God bless you. Where else are you at? Five wise people already. Five wise people already. Come on, ushers, help me out. Where you at? Six. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? Six. Seven up top. Got you over there. Thank you. Seven wise people. Eight back in that family room. Thank you. Oh, down here. Thank you. Eight wise people. God bless you. Who else tonight? You're saying, I need to give God my heart. need to give God my life. You're headed for heaven, denying hell. Anybody else real quick that I did not already see? You got eight wise people already, and I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else real quick? About eight wise people. Who else tonight? You're saying, I know I need to do this. Yeah, I should. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm going to close this up in a moment. I don't want you to miss this opportunity because you've missed enough opportunities in your life. Come on, anybody else? Real quick, when I'm looking in your direction. We're at number nine, number ten. Come on, let's go for God tonight. If that's you. Come on, just pop it up. Thank you. Number nine up there. Got you. Up there behind the sound. With number ten, come on. I can feel you where you at. Sitting there. Thank you, number ten. God bless you. Now listen, I'm not selling knives at the county fair, but is there a number eleven tonight? Let's go for it. We, you were waiting. You said, oh, I just missed it. No, God is calling you out tonight. And you're saying, I need to do this. And I thought I missed it, but no, no, you didn't. Where are you at? Number 11, come on. Come on. Come on. Just pop it up high for me. Who else? Tonight, number 11, just go for it. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 10 wise people. Hallelujah. All right, all 10 of you, you're number 11, 12, or 13. You should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap, and a shout. If you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. I want you to get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. If you're in the foyer or down at Love Rock Cafe, tell an usher to come into the church service right now. This is your time. Let's all stand and welcome them, and you come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Jesus, I believe. You raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. Just come on down. Make your way to the front right now. Jesus, I belong. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You're the reason that I live. They're coming. The you can come too. Jesus, I believe. From the family rooms, come on, you can bring your children. Come on down, they'll remember this. Jesus, I belong. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on, just make your way to the front right now. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I believe. Anybody else? Jesus, I believe. Come on, they're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. If you raise your hand, come on. Get your stuff, get a friend, and get down here. If you didn't, but you need to, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I believe. 
Anybody else tonight? Come on, make your way to the front right now. All right, the reason why I'm kind of excited is because not everybody came. Now, listen, you don't get saved by just raising your hand. Remember, meekness, we're doing this God's way, and God's way is that you've got to offer it to him in prayer. Okay? So I don't want you to start out your first moments in what you consider your walk with God in rebellion because that's not going to work with God. Okay? You'll find yourself resisting the Holy Spirit and that's not a good place. That's not the righteousness or the wisdom of God. And so I'm going to give some instructions. If that's you and you need to come still, just come while I'm giving these instructions. Okay? No shame. No one's judging. Okay? You just come. All right? Now, you guys up front. Thank God you guys have come already. We're excited for you guys. You, you got a new life ahead of you, and great things are ahead of you. Came to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Going to be born again. Now, listen, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. Right over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you? Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel. Really good guy. Nothing weird goes on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you already made it past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight, okay? Maybe Pastor Luke sometimes, but I, he got nothing on me sometimes, okay? So it's all good. Pastor Joel is going to do three things with you. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance so that you know, okay? First thing he's going to do is lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? Brand new on the inside, and, and now there's a new life ahead of you. Secondly, second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you absolutely free, some free literature that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. You know, now that you gave your heart to the Lord, what do you do, all right? Easy reading, maybe 20, 30 minutes if you read slow, okay? It just help you to find out, okay, kind of get my bearings. Now, this is the direction I need to go. I'll, I'll give you a hint. One of them is what we talked about tonight, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Get back to church as much as you can, all right? And then thirdly, he's going to give you what we call a spiritual personal trainer. What is that? Well, you heard of a physical trainer at the gym, helps you get strong, make sure you're eating the right stuff, you know, calls you on the phone during the week, checks on you, that sort of a thing. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually, okay? They're basically, let me break it down to you, simple, plain like this. It's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back to the old way that you go on with God's way, okay? And then right after he's done telling you about that, he'll let you guys come right back out. Now listen, let me make a promise to you before you go, okay? Here's the promise. Give us one year of your life sitting under the teaching here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center consistently, okay? Not on and off, flaky, you know, back and forth, wavering. No, stay consistent. You, you're giving God, I didn't say it, you said, I'm gonna give God all my heart and all my life. Now, let's, let's do this, okay? Come consistently. Give us that year, and at the end of the year and for the rest of your life, you will look at your life and say, man, I did not know I could be this blessed, like we were talking about, true blessing. Okay, it, that's where congratulations are in order. My goodness, look what's going on in your life, okay? Am I telling the truth, everybody? Is that right? Take their word for it, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.